30th. Oh. My name is David Lance and it's May the 30th, 2005 at the Atlanta History Center. This is part of the Veterans Project for the Library of Congress and we're honored today to have with us Coach Paul Koshiwa. I've never been able to pronounce his name <laughs> totally properly. Uh, he was a native of Louisville, Kentucky. He had the distinction of fighting in three of our conflicts in World War II in the Korean campaign and in Vietnam. He's also a legendary figure in Atlanta because he's been the initial football coach in 1955 at Westminster, line coach, their second year of having the varsity football team, and has been a legendary cross-country track coach at Westminster for close to 50 years. And we're just delighted to have Paul with us today, he's somebody I've respected all my life along with a lot of people my age in the city of Atlanta. And Appreciate so much you being here with us to talk to us about your experience growing up and Louisville getting into the war and getting us through three wars. Uh, thank you, David. We appreciate uh, the comments, kind comments. And uh, actually, I grew up in Lowell, Kentucky, and went to a school called Mayo High School because we were into the separate education for male and female. And uh, after uh, high school, I went into uh, Center College at Kentucky and Danville, Kentucky. And when then I <coughs> got, uh, of course, uh, I was going along pretty well, uh, participating in my athletics. Uh, in high school, I played football, and I was playing football at college. and. Uh, also uh, running track and field <clears throat> and uh, we were uh, all having uh, Coca-Cola at the favorite hangout on uh, December 7th, 1941 mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden we heard the terrible news that uh, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and of course that uh, uh, and was met with mixed emotions. A lot of people were uh, all excited, and some were not quite as excited. But uh, then, uh, <clears throat> then the concern turned to, well, when will we be drafted? Once we got into the draft situation, and uh, so uh, rather than uh, getting uh, drafted and going through uh, all that sort of thing, we heard that the Air Force would. Uh, let you finish uh, your degree to go into the flying portion of the Air, Army Air Force then, but um, because uh, they required a college degree for the flying crew. So uh, we said, well, that'd be good. We'd get a little deferment, uh, finish up our school. Of course, this was in 1943, so uh, November, and then about uh, February, I uh, got a nice little letter saying, you need to report to Keister Field in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> so I was on my way and uh, went through classification uh, as <clears throat> and chose to be a uh, uh, navigator and went to navigation school at Ellington Field, uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, from there I went into uh, the combat training, uh, crew training with the B-24s. <clears throat> From there we went on to, uh, uh, started on over to uh, Italy, got our uh, command and uh, we were concerned, picked up a brand new airplane out in Lincoln, Nebraska and thought, well, we'll give it a great name, uh, but we can't decide what, so uh, we're whole crews quibbling over what, what we're going to name this airplane. Of course, on the way, we had a few stops. And I must tell you about uh, one, you want me to tell it now? Sure. About uh, on the way to uh, the uh, base in Italy, we were coming out of Algiers, and uh, we were uh, flying uh, at 8,000 feet. And I remembered uh, at the Al Algeria uh, uh, briefing, uh, I picked up a European map. Well, 
At that time, uh, most of the U.S. and all were still in imperial and not in metric. So uh, I had picked up this European map and uh, we're flying along and uh, about 8,000 feet. The uh, pilot goes, hey, navigator, we going to clear this little bump ahead? I said, well, hell yes. It's only 3,000 feet. He said, hey, come up here in this flight deck and take a look. Ooh, we better, we better do some circling here. And uh, I said, damn, I wonder what went wrong. I said, I'll go down and look. Ooh, that was 3,000 meters. <laughs> which, and it happened to be an encounter with Mount Etna in Sicily, which <laughs> ranges about 9,600 feet, I think. <laughs> So, <clears throat> later on when I was teaching at Westminster, I used to say, well, if it had been a cloudy day, you'd have a different teacher today. <laughs> Not interesting. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we <clears throat> ended up going on into uh, Italy, except we were supposed to go to our call sign, which I think was coffee, uh, the base, and we called in to get landing instructions, and he said, well, the uh, instructions are you're to go to uh, Tea Kettle Base because uh, the orders have been changed. So we said, what in the world is going on? So we fly into Tea Kettle, land Tea Kettle. As soon as we land, man, there are about uh, six or eight mechanics come out and they start tearing off the de-icing boots. and, <laughs> and uh, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing in our plane? He said, it's not your plane anymore. <laughs> and he said, uh, we just lost seven planes today. We got to have this one ready to go in the air tomorrow, so uh, we got to get it combat ready, which they take off with the icing boots and all that stuff. Didn't make it lighter, I guess. So uh, we lost our plane, never got to put the nose art on it, which would have been, <laughs> I'm not sure what we would have named it, but anyway, uh, that's... Uh, where we were, so uh, <clears throat> can we stop a second? No, you can keep going or we can stop, whatever you want to do. So, want to uh, want me to just keep Just keep going, you're doing fine. <laughs> okay. doing great. So, uh, then we got into uh, the base in uh, uh, Italy, it was actually near Foggia, and uh, a little town called Sharagnola, just south of Foggia right there in the uh, Spur area of uh, Italy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we had a nice tent. And, uh, we managed to fix it up pretty well. We got a, a wing tank from one of the planes and put up, uh, and connected some tubing, ran it through the pot belly stove so we could have some hot, hot water to shave with, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it worked out pretty good. But uh, then uh, finally we got uh, going on some missions and uh, what month was this in here? This was in uh, actually, uh, ironically, we landed in uh, on uh, on Southern France Invasion Day, which was in June. Mm -hmm. I think it was June in uh, 1944. Oh, okay. June in 1944. Uh, so uh, <coughs> the uh, no, I believe it was July. Anyway, spring, uh, spring or summer of '44. Yeah, right. It was the uh, actual invasion of southern France that uh, they uh, did. So uh, we uh, got flying some missions, and finally, uh, about our uh, well, my first mission uh, was, uh, of course, we were uh, very concerned because it was the Ploesti oil fields, not the first Ploesti raid, but the We'd heard so much about the Ploesti oil fields and the defense around uh, Ploesti, so uh, we uh, cruised on over, which was going okay, and then finally uh, the waste gunner called and said, oh, there's a P-47 out here. Yeah, I said, man, there's no P-47s around here. I said, that's got to be uh, Fock Wolf uh, 90, I guess it was, mm -hmm. FW-90, anyway, they were... Uh, had sort of the same profile as the uh, uh, P-47, but <clears throat> but fortunately it didn't bother us when we got on back. But uh, on a little 
later mission, uh, a few more missions down the road, we were going to over uh, Linz, Austria, with Hermann Goring Tank Works. We were going to bomb a, uh, and we had uh, <coughs> experienced a little difficulty on our turbocharger, and uh, we were kind of lagging from our group, and there were, well, I guess there were probably uh, 800,000 planes in the air that day, but we were lagging between uh, our group and the group behind us, and <coughs> we probably should have dropped back to that group, or we should have earlier turned home, gone back home, because, uh, but we were so gung-ho to uh, get a mission in that we decided we would uh, press on, and we went over this target in between two groups, which wasn't very healthy because the flak was uh, rather fast and furious, and we got hit by some flak, and as we came off of the target, we uh, were jumped by seven uh, ME-109s, and uh, <clears throat> they made one pass at us, and on this pass uh, we didn't know what happened exactly because we lost our intercom, and uh, we know we gotten pretty well shot up, and uh, I had uh, I felt something on my leg. You know, I didn't know exactly what it was, but it was stinging <laughs> pretty bad, and uh, so uh, finally uh, we uh, saw these seven planes came by, and uh, five of them apparently took off, and two of them came around for supposedly the kill, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, by that time, our ball turret gunner had gotten decommissioned in his turret and he crawled out. Well, the whole back end of the plane, they were all shot up. The tail gunner and the two wing uh, waist gunners, they were in pretty bad shape. And uh, the, uh, so, the, but the tail gunner, I mean, the ball turret gunner climbed out and he grabbed one of the uh, waist guns and on the second pass from these two ME-109s, he got it confirmed kill on one of them, and the other one took off, but <clears throat> but we were uh, having, weren't sure just what was going on, so uh, I uh, had grabbed a uh, morphine syrette and a compress and wrapped it around my leg where I'd gotten hit, and uh, I, well, I'd already crawled to the back to see what was going on there, and then I crawled up the nose to uh, see if the bombardier was okay, and then uh, I grabbed him and set him on the back and went upstairs trying to uh, decide if we were just where we need to go, uh, tell the pilot where to go. So, uh, by crawling through the bomb bay, we had probably a couple inches of uh, gas in the bomb bay area because uh, the tanks, even though they were self-sealing supposedly, they leaked quite a bit for so we felt like we were flying uh, uh, bomb, but but we managed to uh, head back and uh, got into uh, finally got into Fuji, and uh, uh, the uh, crew, the medical techs uh, came out and met us and uh, uh, I can't, oh yeah it was Madeline Carroll who was one of the uh, workers at the hospital, uh, one of the volunteers, and the, the uh, med techs, well, you'll be greeted by Madeline Kell, uh, and sure enough, we were, and, uh, but spent a good bit of time at the hospital, but uh, I always feel somewhat fortunate, actually, on that crew, six of us uh, had gotten hit, and uh, one of them, uh, and, he was only uh, grazed a little bit by flak, and, and he went back the next day to the group. And the other five of our crew of ten went out two days later, and they were confirmed that they had uh, they were carrying these 100-pound uh, incendiaries, and uh, they'd gotten hit in the bomb bay and exploded. So uh, you, you never know about uh, how provident uh, it might have been. But uh, we got uh, the ones of us that survived were actually uh, spared that day because we weren't with the crew. They picked up some 
make up crew. But <clears throat> okay. Paul, were you scared or were you just running on adrenaline during a flight well, like that? Well, you, you, get, you can be pretty scared but still uh, be functional. No. <laughs> I mean, you weren't scared, you were, you were functional. No. But you had to, you kept your, I think most of us kept our senses about us. How long were you laid up? Unable to fly after that. Well, I stayed in the hospital uh, a couple months, I guess. I'd uh, actually what had happened is I got hit twice in the leg, and uh, fortunately the uh, bullets were somewhat spent, so they just they lodged through the uh, uh, fibula and lodged into the tibia, mm -hmm. and uh, of course they had to be uh, extracted, but. Uh, Took a while for the shattered uh, uh, fibula to uh, sure. re regrow. So uh, then I went back to the squadron and uh, served as gunnery officer for a while to make sure the uh, guys cleaned the guns when they came in. Mm -hmm. For and I was off flying status for about nine or ten months. So how many missions did you actually fly? I got in seven and. Uh, before I got back, well, I got back on flying status and got uh, seven total in uh, Italy is all I got. Goodness gracious, that was enough. <laughs> One sounds like it was. A... By that time, we it was uh, the Germans had capitulated and uh, yeah. we were uh, actually uh, on orders to go to uh, Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, Japanese uh, had finally surrendered. Did you finish college before you went into the service? Oh no. You went in after? I was a junior in college when junior I enlisted college. and uh, got pulled out my uh, junior year. This is May the 30th, 2005. Do you remember where you were May the 30th, 1945? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was still over in uh, uh, Italy. No. May 30th. But the European theater had ground a halt. Right. They, they, uh, I think the Germans capitulated in early May. May the 8th. Uh, May the 8th, right. Yeah. Did you fly any more combat missions after your injury, did you say? I misunderstood. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, did you do seven more? No, uh, one. I only got in one more after that. But. One more after that. Mm -hmm. Were you scared going up having been shot? Well, a little gun shot, right? Did you ever man a tail gun yourself? Or no, I never gun? fired a gun at all. Just ran into 3,000 foot mountains that were 9,000 feet tall? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came back and finished kind of center college. That's right, I finished college. And uh, I, well, actually when I got, uh, when I got uh, discharged, uh, he said, well, you want to be in the reserve? I said, well, what's what's involved? And, well, you know, uh, just be on call. I said, well, oh, yeah, I'll do that. So uh, I hadn't, didn't, wasn't any unit anywhere in there. I was at the time, uh, uh, 1948. Well, I coached a couple of years in Danville, Kentucky, and uh, at the high school, and then uh, I went down to uh, take a job at the Citadel coaching at, uh, in Charleston and uh, there we uh, uh, went down and actually we were still having freshman football team back then. The freshmen weren't eligible to play in college so we took, uh, I was in charge of the freshman football team and, uh, and the assistant to the track coach and then uh, the next year, I, this was 1948, the next year I uh, became the uh, head track coach and uh, then uh, the 19, September 1950 I got a nice telegram saying, uh, you have been selected for recall, <laughs> you will report. <laughs> so uh, I had just gotten married in August. And uh, said, well, that's we'll, we'll do it. Here we are. You're back to uh, being a military uh, wife and wife this time instead of a prep. But uh, we uh, 
went in, I went with the, started out with the transport service, the military air tra transport. And uh, <clears throat> at uh, that point, uh, finally, uh, they got a reassigned to uh, Korea mm -hmm. with uh, a group uh, in Seoul, we went to Seoul City Air Base right outside of Seoul. And uh, our mission was to uh, drop leaflets uh, and uh, also we had two aircraft, two C-47s outfitted with uh, loudspeakers. We had a Korean girl and a uh, um, Chinese girl that uh, would uh, actually talk over the loudspeakers that were uh, outfitted on the plane. We'd, we'd circle at uh, around 200 feet and uh, they would talk to the frontline troops, a simple message like, come to the U.S. lines and live and uh, we'll, we'll make sure you're uh, protected uh, when you surrender and uh, that sort of thing. But the, uh, there was a world of difference, uh, of course, in, in, the Europe, in Germany, uh, so much of the uh, uh, heavy guns, they were tracking by radar and uh, some of it was volley type, but uh, over in uh, Korea there, when we'd go on some of these missions, we'd look out the window, wonder, wonder who they're shooting at over there. Uh, they must be shoot somebody else over there. No, I think they're trying to shoot at us. <laughs> it was such a haphazard uh, type uh, shooting so that uh, there was no real threat to, might have been some uh, uh, up on the Yalu, but uh, but I don't know, it wasn't where we were. We were down on the, near the front lines. But every Sunday we had a uh, newspaper type leaflet that we dropped and went to uh, all these various towns and dropped these bundles. They'd be fused to separate about a thousand feet and drift down. But, uh, we had, uh, on that tour, I flew uh, 75 missions, and some of them now, in addition to the loudspeakers, we also did uh, moonlight expeditions that uh, we had a crew of uh, people that uh, would uh, drop behind the lines, do sabotage uh, type work. And, uh, We'd take them in on a moonlight night so we'd get uh, into the drop zone and uh, drop them in the, on a static line about 200 feet. And they'd they'd uh, stay behind the line. Some of them stay uh, three or four weeks and uh, work their way back. And uh, we had uh, always amazed me because the 8th Army had, uh, there was one major from, from Brooklyn. And uh, you're familiar with Brooklyn, you know. Chase by us, uh, 33rd Street, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we never understood how he could uh, uh, evade the Koreans that long. <laughs> he couldn't understand it. <laughs> He'd been across the line nine different times. Uh, and uh, I, we never did understand how he could uh, manage to get back all the time. But apparently uh, he was responsible for uh, some sabotage work upsetting a bunch of generals. Uh, some conference they were having and uh, that sort of thing. But occasionally we'd, uh, we'd run into a little trouble. They'd uh, capture one of them and it'd still you'd get the resupply mission. Uh, about every uh, so often you have to go back and resupply them mm -hmm. at a given point. So that would turn out sometimes to be a uh, uh, small arms nest. Yeah. So. You just said adios and took off. <laughs> uh, you did that for how long? For two years? Oh no, that actually that Korean trip uh, tour was uh, very simple. We were so short of navigators, and these missions were so short mm -hmm. that I flew 75 missions in 88 days, and I spent a week in Tokyo and a week a week in Nagoya. <laughs> I know. So. And then I got home, back, sent back home, back to Kelly Field in Texas, 
and I uh, went right back to my old apartment and everything right there. It was uh, kind of amazing that uh, we had uh, <clears throat> all those sharp missions. We'd uh, bite off and get up, fly one before breakfast, come back and eat breakfast, go out about noon, fly another mission and uh, come back at lunch and go out and take another one. So some days we get three missions in. Were the MIGs being used against you at that time? Uh, we, we never encountered <coughs> the MIGs. Uh, uh, the only time we had any threat at all, we did have some uh, drops up near the Yalu. Mm -hmm. And any time we got up near the Yalu, we always had to be extremely careful. Were your combat missions in Italy you ever accompanied by the Tuskegee Airmen? We've interviewed some of those. No, no I don't think... Uh, we didn't have them as escorts. Okay. I think they were operating mostly out of England, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally sure. I thought some of them were. Well, they uh, might have been, but uh, uh, to my uh, knowledge, no. We, uh, we had uh, um, P-38s and, uh, and, uh, and P-51s. Yeah. P so you came back to the United States when in 1951? Uh, that was actually in uh, 54, 52, 52. 52. Right. And did you and finish college by that time? Well, oh yeah, I'd finished college in 46. Okay. And uh, I had, uh, so in 52, uh, I decided to stay in the Air Force a little longer. And then uh, along about 54, we had our first son, and uh, at that point they were uh, doing a lot of uh, riffing or a reduction in force. And uh, the ones of us didn't get uh, kicked out. We were uh, flying 20, 25 days a month mm -hmm. so uh, on the transport. So uh, my wife decided, uh, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I want to be here 25 days alone <laughs> every month. And so I decided to get, get out and went back to uh, Charleston. She was from Charleston, so uh, we went back to Charleston. I didn't try to go back to Citadel because the whole staff had changed while I was gone and a uh, whole new crew in there. And I <clears throat> decided I'd go uh, back to the high school coaching and teaching. So I went to North Charleston High School and in North Charleston, I uh, stayed a year and then connected uh, the following year with, uh, or that summer, with uh, Dr. Presley at Westminster. And uh, finally uh, decided I moved to Atlanta. And, uh, it was sort of my, my family was up in Louisville and her family was over in Charleston and we figured Atlanta would be about equidistant to the two, so uh, we settled on Atlanta. How did you meet Bill Presley? The job fair, or was he found No, you? actually, he, um, it was an interesting story. We had, my wife had a, a, a distant type relative that lived down on Piedmont, right across from Piedmont Park. Mm -hmm. And her brother was uh, a developer and a real estate person who helped uh, was around when they uh, developed Ansley Park. Okay. And uh, she knew uh, a lot of people uh, through him and through her. She would, when she became an invalid, uh, we would stop by and see her. And uh, she kept, uh, we were coming through that summer. Uh, actually, I was on my way to interview in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And also had a uh, interview in Atlanta with uh, Russell High School down at East Point. And uh, <clears throat> she said, well, this is a wonderful school. Uh, it's just starting out here. And uh, a wonderful man. Uh, he's a good friend of uh, the Stearns, who's a big banking family. Uh, you probably know the name. Uh, so, uh, so we went on to Louisville. Well, in Louisville, I got a call. She had apparently called out to the school and said I was looking for a job. And Presley uh, asked me if I could stop by for an interview on the way back. So uh, I said, well, yeah, sure, I'd stop. So 
Um, it all sounded pretty good, so uh, I decided I would take it. And my wife and I, at the time, we had grown to like San Antonio so much, we said, well, mm -hmm. we'll stay a couple of years and head on back to San Antonio. But uh, here I am. 50 years later. 50 years, years later. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that Paul Koshery was one of the great coaches of my career as a high school football player, which didn't last very long. But well, I didn't anyway. tell you about that, though, uh, the, uh, David. The, uh, you know, uh, I think that year, uh, the second year I coached when Charlie Burke came, yeah. we had uh, Lee Nally was still there when, with you. Yes. And Right. And uh, with Charlie Burke, we had that perfect season, 0 and 10. <laughs> And uh, that's about the time I uh, think I convinced Presley that I could, uh, uh, I had that boy, uh, Ted Mueller, yeah. who was a uh, good, uh, turned out to be a pretty good little track man, but I thought he needed some uh, distance training, so I'd gotten him to run some cross country while I was coaching the football that year, and him and a few other uh, uh, boys, they got them to run some, and I said, well, it'd be nice if I could start this cross-country team. So uh, then uh, we agreed to shuffle around some people, and uh, I forgot who was the big uh, Bulldog Williams, I think, came in. And <laughs> Bulldog left. He'd been there in 1954, 50. Yeah. 53, 54 is when Bulldog was there, I think. Yeah. And then he, he left about 55 or so. Oh, yeah, he left before I did. That's yeah. both. No, there was another uh, one named Williams came in. Uh, gosh, I, I didn't know him. Uh, no, he was after you. Yeah. Right? Anyway, uh, I convinced him to take over the cross country team, and uh, probably was the best thing that ever happened. The next year they went. Uh, almost perfect season the other way, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was uh, uh, good for both uh, both sides. And what happened during Vietnam? How did you get the lucky distinction of... <laughs> well, uh, coming back to Atlanta here, uh, they actually had a uh, uh, navigator's training uh, squadron out at uh, Dobbins. And, uh, I said, well, I'm going to keep up my proficiency because uh, when I got recalled in uh, 1950, I had to brush up some on navigation skills and catch up on the newer equipment. And uh, I said, it'd be nice in case something happened again to keep up the skills. So uh, I went out and joined that uh, navigation unit out at Dobbins. We were flying on the Unibird C-47. And uh, the, uh, actually a little extra paid and hurt with, uh, with the school salary. Uh, and that was long before uh, uh, Woodruff uh, left us at $22 million, I think, out of Westminster. But uh, the, uh, so we did, uh, did that spot. And then when the uh, mission changed it, uh, Dobbins, they brought in the C-124s, and of course they were going to need navigators, so they eliminated the navigation squadron, and we all signed over to be on the cruise of the C-124s, which I was in, and uh, doing that, and actually in reserve status we had uh, flown some uh, missions as uh, uh, into Vietnam. On, uh, during like the summertime, I'd uh, you'd catch a flight or two and take a trip over to Vietnam. But in 1968, with the Tet Offensive, uh, President Johnson put the bite on us and uh, we got recalled hmm. and uh, started flying full time for about a year and a half. So you were 44, 45 years old by this time? Well, let me see. 22 to uh, 68. 46. 46. You may have been the oldest combatant. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Might have been one of the oldest navigators. That's what I looked at. And how many missions did you fly into Vietnam? Or? Oh, it looks like uh, we were trying to get one every month. Uh, uh, in fact, that's on the Vietnam mission from the state side here. We would almost exceed our flying uh, hours for the month mm -hmm. because we logged like 110 flying hours in that old uh, C-124 because it was low and slow. Yeah. And uh, we were only maximum 130 hours a month and uh, uh, 330 for the uh, three months, or 300 for the, I think it was 300 for the uh, three months period. So. so where would you fly from? Well, we would leave out of Dobbins. Uh, a lot of times we would uh, have to go to the East Coast somewhere and pick up some. In fact, my, my first trip uh, that uh, went to Vietnam. We went over to uh, uh, Dover, Delaware, uh, and uh, we picked up all this pure steel planking, which they would use for uh, runways. Mm -hmm. We thought, well, we uh, loaded up the plane with all this PSP, and uh, we fly on in and get into Tonsonut. So uh, at Saigon, and uh, we uh, end up saying, well, ask one of them, well, where's, where's the runway? Oh, this is not for runway, this is to sandbag around all the uh, bays for the airplanes because they throw so many uh, grenades in here that we have to protect the planes on the ground. So yeah. they would stand this pure steel planking on ends and then sandbag around them, <laughs> try to keep the uh, grenades from uh, coming in on them. Did you have any any aircraft fire that you all directed in Vietnam? Uh, very little. Uh, the uh, most ex <coughs> exciting thing we would see uh, is the uh, uh, gunships, uh, I don't know if you what you call the name of them. Uh, anyway, the, uh, with the Gatling gun on them, yeah, they had some C4. C four well, he was C forty seven. Okay. He had to outfit it with him, I think, and uh, with the uh, uh, Gatlin gun, and uh, we come in sometimes. Uh, well, actually, uh, coming into uh, uh, Tonsonute there, mm -hmm. to, uh, we would have to come in on a steep approach, uh, normal approach, with uh, five hundred feet a minute descent, and we come in high and go down. 1,500 feet uh, a minute because uh, they would be lobbing uh, small arms at us, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, everything there was just small arms, and uh, but to come in and see, uh, you'd, you'd think they had searchlights out, but it, it was nothing but the stream of the tracer bullets from these Gatlin guns coming mm -hmm. across. It looked like just a stream of light. But I think every six. Uh, round was a tracer, so uh, they fired some. Uh, the Gatlin gun was incredible. Were you philosophic about it by this time? You figured that if it's going to be your time, it's going to be your time, and if not, oh, you know, oh yeah, well, you'd already been had your time and you right. nicked it. Uh, I think pretty much uh, had decided that uh, it's going to be what's going to be. No. And, uh, pretty much philosophical, yes. Paul, the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. In the fall of that year, I think 70 80 percent of the United States population was still isolationist, and yet when Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was a uniformity of resolve about what should be done in this country. And on September the 11th, 2001, we were attacked again, even more so in this country. And the resolve hasn't been quite as uniform since that time about what our mission and goal should be. Have you got any thoughts about that? Well, the, you've spanned, you've got a unique perspective having been there from both of them. As, uh, as I see it, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm to. Uh, 
get in and do what you could for the country back in uh, the loyal loyalty to the country in uh, World War II. But during uh, Korea, I think there were a lot of uh, doubts first as whether we should have been there mm -hmm. and what action we should have taken. And uh, <clears throat> I think there were a lot of misgivings uh, and people began to lose some of that enthusiasm, and I think even more in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think it's even carried over to 2001, where uh, there's less enthusiasm about uh, about defending ourselves. Do you think it's possible to reach a point in time in the world where we will be able to live in peace, which is the gold standard? Do you think it's just not in man's nature to? I, I, I frankly don't think it will ever happen where it would be a total peace. You know. Someone's always going to want to, to attack somebody else, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that we'll get to a point in time to where the powers of the world will want to live in peace and we'll be able to have policemen's wars and minor countries to where the third threat of a world war like we had in World War II will not really be there? Um, yeah, in a way I don't think it will ever evolve into a total uh, <clears throat> conflict like that, yeah. of that magnitude. I think it's going to be like brush fires yeah. here and there. Any thoughts about the atomic bomb? You were there when it was dropped. You were not there, but you <laughs> were in the military still. Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, uh, I had some misgivings, although um, last year uh, when I went to Japan, my wife and I went to Japan, and we went to the uh, uh, Hiroshima site mm -hmm. and the point zero, the ground zero, and uh, after seeing some of the uh, Results, I would say, I, I, I wasn't all that far, but in rationale, I think I rationalized that in the end it was the wise move because yeah. it put, uh, didn't prolong it, what could have happened sure. had, had it gone on and on and on. So, although it was a terrible thing. I no. think uh, the atomic bomb was uh, a pretty drastic thing, but in rationalizing, I think in the end it probably was good. When you all were bombing, and you don't need to tell me definitively how you feel one way or the other, but did you, were you concerned about, what was the general feeling about civilian casualties, whether it be firebombing raids of Dresden in February 1945, the firebombing raids in Tokyo in March of 1945. What, what was your feelings about inflicting civilian casualties? Just the price of war? Or? Well, I guess in a way it was the price of war. And uh, as uh, one of my old buddies uh, <coughs> that went through navigation school with, uh, we were discussing that one night at dinner we were having when he came to Atlanta. But uh, he uh, said, well, uh, someone asked that you know, about bombing and not always hitting the target, killing civilians. All of a sudden, his comment was, "Well, it was either them or us." No. So, uh, in a way, I guess you almost have to take that attitude. But I think it's terrible when you do uh, involve the uh, civilian population. But it's something that. It's but I think it's one of the uh, things of war that's going to have to happen. Are there any other thoughts you'd like to leave my generation, future generations, <laughs> children, grandchildren, about your experiences in life? Something like well, uh, let's see, David. I think, uh, as I've told my kids, I think uh, it's an experience I wouldn't want to go through again, no. but I wouldn't give a million dollars to not have had it. No. Well, on behalf of my generation, and people after me, Paul. I want to express my sincere appreciation to you for what you did for us in three different wars and what you did for me as, as a young teenager learning how to play football at Westminster. 
you've been a great inspiration to literally hundreds and thousands of people throughout this region and will always be forever in your debt. Well, thank you very much. Do you, do you want to get the um, that, uh, Coliseum comment? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to have to turn this over one oh, okay. second. Turn it over. We're going to stop for a second and turn it back. Generation and people after they fall. I want to Tell us about when you went to the Coliseum. Oh, okay. Uh, I was on an R&R &R, uh, in uh, Rome, and uh, I'm going along taking pictures everywhere. I went past the Victor Emanuel Monument and sapping some pictures. A couple of dog-faced GIs were up ahead of me. And as we rounded the corner, uh, we could look down uh, the hill and saw the Coliseum. Now, you got to realize that we had taken great pains to make sure all the treasures of Rome were uh, untouched. So uh, there wasn't uh, anything that we tried to do around Rome, but as we turned the corner, one GI poked the other one in the rib. God damn, we bombed the hell out of that place. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, they didn't know the Roman history very well. The Paul told me that when I interviewed him 15 years ago at a party we had. I want him to hold up just real briefly. Hold these up in front of you, a couple of them. These are the pamphlets that they dropped in Korea. Uh, hold it up in front of you. Okay. Uh, warning the people about evacuating the area and also about s delayed fuse bombs. And his left hand is the, fa the fuse bomb thing, just giving instructions. And for those of you who view this in years to come, he went to Westminster and had Coach Kasha as a coach. This is what he looked like when he was a young flyboy over in Italy. In North Africa, he's always been handsome. <laughs> <laughs>